Here's two really good examples of a plated bottom and a twined bottom. So when we left Metlakatla, we put all of our cedar in these brown paper bags so that the cedar can breathe and not get moldy. Um, so they're all nice and dry. Our next step would be to um, cut them all to the size of the basket that we're going to be making. But we wanted to show you that there are actually two different ways that you can start your plated bottoms. Um, so you can either cut all of these to length or you can start them out like this. When you're pulling your bark through the stripper, you leave them connected at the top, which helps stabilize when you're doing your plating. We're gonna soak our cedar bark in cold water um, because, I think that's fine. That's good. Because hot water breaks down the material faster so we're just going to make sure they're nice and wet. Um, and it doesn't have to be soaking wet, we just want to be able to weave with them. And once they're soaked, we're going to take our form and we're just going to measure how big the warps need to be. And once we get our measurement, we'll cut our pieces and that will give us the correct size for our plating. These are forms that we're going to be using for our baskets. We can use glass or ceramic. You don't want to use metals because the iron and the metals will soak into the materials and break it down. And we want to make sure that the bottoms have a really nice edge. They don't want to be too round because that will affect the way the cedar comes up for the side of the basket. We only soaked a few of our bundles because we don't want to soak too many at at one time because if we don't use all of them again it's going to create it's going to break down the process of the cedar and it will also give it a darker color so we don't want to do too much too soon um, but it's okay to do like one bundle or a couple bundles more just in case you need them if you do soak more than you need you can just set it down to dry we're going to take a small piece of our weavers which is the thinner um, thinner strips you can see here than the warps. For stabilization, the basic twine, and we're just gonna soak that as well. And that's gonna hold our pieces together as we do the plating. So Candy, these are the warps that I prepared when I was in Metlakatla. And because I'm a complete novice, some of these are not consistently the same thickness. Is that going to be a problem? Yes, you want them all to be as consistent as you can possibly manage. So if you feel down here on this one, it has a nice um, even consistency all the way through, except down here at the very, very bottom. And you can see there's a little ridge on either side where you can see where it naturally wants to split. So you can just take your paring knife and just take that piece off. Okay. Now, if you compare the two, you can see how nice and thin that one is. Yes. Yeah. Compared to this one. Oh yeah, that's almost yeah, twice as thick. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to want to, again, feel for the consistency. And it looks like this one all the way through, you're going to want to split again. Okay. Is there going to be a problem when you come to plate the bottom if it's too thin? If it's too thin, it's going to scrunch up, which is going to cause problems, yes. Okay. When you thin it, be sure to soften it a little bit, keeping it straight. You're then, softening and it? Then, yes, the back and then of the you just go in. Because you don't need a lot off of there, so feel it. Oh yeah, that's now the same thickness. Okay. And keep, see your two, two fingers together so you have control, because if you did this, it would break off. So now that your bark is 
all soaked, you're going to want to go through all of your strands and make sure they're all consistent okay. so you can start your plating. This one's too thick, I think. So again, she's using the back of the knife to soften the cedar bark. When she's scraping it like that, it's not just softening it, it's separating the layers. Feel it. Okay, now mm -hmm. feel these. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it's much thicker. thicker. Okay. So we're not going to so split going... the whole thing. No. We're just going to take it apart at the ends. Right. Then we want to try and use the same amount of pressure all the way down. But if it gets thin, too thin on this one, then I'll turn it around, but it's going great. So, and again, you're using those two fingers to stabilize it. This is the length that you took off. Can you still use that? Can I use that yes, for the base? Yes, you can use it for a finer band. Oh, for finer, okay. So, because it's thinner than right. this one. We're going to hold it with our ring finger and our middle finger of our right hand, or left hand if you're left-handed, and then grab that top piece with your thumb and pointer, and then just slowly pulling down with our left hand in the back. Your right hand is here just to stabilize. And as you're working, you can take your time and feel it. If it starts getting thicker again on the right side, go ahead and start thinning that out. And just match it up. And when you do it, you always keep them separate. Don't put it back in the same place because you might try doing it again. And so I usually keep the finished ones to one side. So now that we've gone through and we've checked that all of the cedar is the correct thickness, we're going to measure on whatever the mold's going to be, in this case it's a beaker, and we're just going to go up the side, down the bottom, up the other side, we're going to check and make sure that it's even, and then that's going to be the length we cut for the plating. I give it half an inch over the actual size of the basket that we're going to be leaving. And we're just going to cut enough. On each side or one side? On, for each side. So our plating is going to go across diagonally and horizontally, so we're going to cut just enough to go both ways. Okay. But does that then mean that the basket's only that high? Mm -hmm. So we're cutting our warps to a smaller size basket for a beginning learner and that's going to give us the opportunity to still practice the technique of the basic twine and false embroidery. We'll just keep placing it, placing our warps as close together as possible and just measure from one and to the other. So right now we're at six. It looks like you might need three or four more. Oops. So it looks like that's one, two, three, good. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So let's cut eight more pieces. And if you do it, if you plate them tight enough, you might be able to do nine and nine. So this one has a section that's just wanting to come away. Yep. What would you advise? I would just gently pull that away. It's not going to affect your warp at all. Okay. And then again, this bit goes quite wide. So should I just take some of that edge off? Mm-hmm. Looks like it wants to come away there. Right, exactly. Okay. So then they're all the same width and the same depth. Yes. Okay. 
Now so. that we have all of our warps, we're gonna measure the center of our basket and we don't want the cedar to be poking out on either side of our piece here because we're gonna be twining and it's gonna fill that space as you come up the edge of the basket. So now that we know where our center is, we're gonna do a basic twine, just one stitch all the way across so that we can hold it in place when we're doing the plating. She's about to start her plated bottom and she has measured all of her warps and given herself about an inch, an inch and a half up the side of her mold and placed all together. It's about as wide as she needs. And she's going to do that both ways, vertical and horizontal. So I'm just, I'm just going to tape this. Okay. And it's just going to hold them in place as we do this basic twine. Okay. So what Dolores is doing now is a stabilization stitch, twining, to hold them in place. Yes. And she's weaving from left to right and over one, under one. And one is a non-working weaver and you make it X. She's going to make her X. Lifting up a warp, going under, and doing it again. Make your X under the so warp. So you lift up a warp, you place the weaver behind it, behind it, and flat. And flat. Her hands will stop just automatically because she knows the material needs to be moist. So you're going to take the working weaver and you're going to put it behind the next warp. And then you're going to take the non-working weaver and put it in front of that warp. And now you're going to take that that working weaver and put it on top, making an X, and it now becomes the non-working weaver. And this is the Z twist. And we're going to repeat that for every warp. Keeping the weaver straight. Keeping them straight. So they alternate. They're working, then they're not working, then they're working, then they're not working. Yes. Crossing it over the top of that, making your X, weaving behind the warp with the new working, and we're being careful not to twist them, right? We want to keep them flat. And we're stopping right here. Why is it important to keep them flat? So that it creates pearly uniform stitches. The one thing you do with the awl is to straighten these so there's a straight line. And to make sure it's straight, you take and hold the warp underneath. And straighten it. We're practicing the basic twine, um, just making sure that we have our tension down right, our hand hold. 
before we start the base of her basket. We want to try to avoid twists in our, see how these ones don't twist as you're going across? So we're going to ensure that doesn't happen on this left side. It's going to lay flat and I use my thumb to hold that left one. I'm making your X right over left and then I use my pointer finger to pull down that next warp and pull it around. Okay, that makes sure it's nice and tight. And again, just give it a little tug. Left down, right over left. So we're just gonna do our basic twine. The left comes over, the right goes on the top. We're gonna pick up our another piece. And we're going to continue the weave. Comes over. Make an X. We can just set that right on top. It's going to be behind. And doing this in your hand gives you more control. And if, say, this piece was up here, I'd be able to just tug on it a little bit to make them all even. Cross over, make an X. Add our next piece. I'm just going to tug on them just to make sure they're all about the same length. I'm going to use my awl to make sure they're in the same place. Nice straight line. And this basic twine is going to keep our plating nice and even for our square. We're going to just fold back every other one. Take our warp. And we're going to take and just pull up each individual warp going vertically and making sure it's nice and snug. And we're going to, I'm going to do that from each end to the other so that it eliminates those gaps in the weaving. So for the next row, to give it that nice plating, we're going to, the one that it's crossed over, we're going to lift those ones up and do the same thing. And I'm going to give these ones that I just pulled a little tug, and that's going to help keep it secure as well. So as I'm putting this new warp in, I'm kind of tugging up on this piece and pushing this one up so that there's no space there. If I were to just lay them flat like this and push, it's going to create this wavy look to it that we're trying to eliminate. So we want it to be nice and flat, nice and even, which is why you want to take your time and really go under each one individually. 
So here you find this center and you don't start and you don't allow it just to flip over. You take this one and pull it up and over so that it is established. And then maybe I'll take this one next and it's established. And then this one over, up and over, and then finally that one. And then I look to see how square it is, and then I awl it again to make sure that I've kept it. Um, when you pull these down, be sure that they are really tight against your weave because it keeps it tight. When you place it up and over, you're able to keep it flat without wrinkling. With plating, people think that it's just a crude technique of weaving. Some of the most um, elegant looking mats or separate room separators that were in long houses were done with, um, you know, really mathematical concentric squares that required every piece to be exact in dimension and in form and in placement. So you said at the beginning you have eight laying down, but then seven to plate horizontally? Yeah, because you lose space. In an ideal world, you'd be able to do eight and eight. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you lose space. Yeah. Well, with mom doing it, the likelihood is we're going to need an eighth one. Because she can get it really tight? Yeah, she's making that effort. You can see how she's much she's pulling at it. She pulls it back, and then she allows it to come back down. And, and then, it, then um, you know, with her finger, what she's doing without saying is she's awling it with her finger, but she's also rubbing it back where it becomes flat again. Do you need more water? Um, yeah. What's the importance of, of keeping it moist like you're doing now? You don't want it too moist okay. either. Because if you get it too wet, then it's going to shrink more. The less water you put on it, the better. But then if you don't add water, it's going to break. They really rubbed it too when I worked with that woman in Metlakatla, when she was doing this, she really, she actually used a jam jar, you know, your canning jar, canning container, and she would rub it, rub it, rub it. I think that's why there were stone malls too, you know, the stone malls that they had? Yeah. That, you, like for you today, you find in grinding your, um, Spices. Mm -hmm. You you do that to make it nice and flat. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. That's it. Yeah, I would. And Dolores, what is that that you're using at the moment? This is actually the ulna for my deer, but you do, you want to make sure it's not sharp. So right now you have seven going horizontal, and we have eight going vertical, do you want to add that eighth one horizontally to make it square? Does it fit? You always make sure it fits with the... You don't want it to peek at you, so this stitch is going to be removed, right? So you're not you actually measuring. Right. Because it's a base stitch, so you're moving this right to here. Okay, so I add one more then. Okay. And and what we're discussing here determine can, is really by um, how we manipulated the material. So Dolores, what are you doing with this piece? 
I'm actually tightening the last one so that so then it's really compact. The square will be tight. And I usually don't pull on that last one because it, it pulls on that end one. And then you just took that piece out. Right. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Where I usually do my, uh, have seven and eight, but that's because of her technique of really compacting that. It's just a variation of how we handle plating. The main thing is you want to have a perfect square. Yeah.